Hey everybody, good to see you again. It's Daryl. Welcome back. So uh, I hope you guys are feeling pretty good and settling in. I, I'm pretty pleased. I was able to get uh, uh, most of your uh, discussions graded today and everybody did a really great job with that. There's a lot of uh, great interaction. Uh, I've gone through uh, some of the TED Talks and get all the rest of the grades and of the uh, TED Talk reviews back to you tomorrow, but everything I've seen so far tells me that uh, you guys are, are pretty much on track, so I'm feeling pretty good about this. Um, before we uh, get into what we're doing this week, uh, there's not that many people here. I'm going to try to turn on all the mics. Uh, usually I, I don't do this, but it seemed to be okay last time. If you've got a lot of noise on, you can mute on your end if you don't want to talk, but uh, basically I just want you guys to, to just... Uh, Tell me how you're feeling. Do you feel like you've settled in? Is this starting to make sense? Do you feel comfortable? You guys okay? Yeah. Doing good? Yeah, we're really good. All right. Yeah, anybody absolutely. have any problems? Or anybody have any questions about this, something that seems odd to you? I know uh, that this is also the first week of this new interface, and, and I think might have been a little bit of server issue. Uh, seemed like everybody got their homework in, and anybody who doesn't, uh, you know, I, I extended you, so you still have time to get it in. But uh, anybody having any issues with anything? No, not really. Nope, not at all. All right, so all making sense to you? Yes. Absolutely. All right. Yep. Well, that's great. I want you to feel good. I want you to feel confident. This is a, this is a creative class, so you, you, you can't be frightened. You just got to be bold and put it out there. And, and uh, I want you to know you're doing great, so I want you to feel great. So um, last week we looked at um, a bunch of presentations by other people, and now we're starting to do the process of creating a presentation ourselves. So uh, last week was kind of the introduction phase. This is the uh, this week we're going to call it the planning phase. This is where we're going to start to create our presentation, and we're going to do the readings about that and so forth. So. Um, this week, uh, we're switching to the other book for the most part. Uh, last week, we read mostly from Resonate. This week, the re most of the readings are from Slideology, which, is uh, you remember, is the book that's more really about the actual process of creating slides and so forth. Uh, there's another, there is one chapter from Resonate, but there's like five chapters from uh, Slideology that, that you want to get into in the reading. And... Um, while Resonate is mostly about the philosophy and theory of presentations, which is why it was important to get started reading that last week, this is about the nuts and bolts. So we're reading the chapters about starting a presentation and figuring out the, the, uh, the beginning planning phases of it. And that's what the reading is about. Um, and this uh, uh, one of the chapters from Slideology is called the five theses of the power of presentation. So because this was the first book she wrote, this was sort of her, some of her initial philosophical thinking about it. And so she looked at presentations. She said, what, what are the important things to think about for a presentation? And she tried to boil it down to five important tenets. And uh, some of this stuff certainly sp spilled over into resonate as well. And so the first thing that she wants to sell us it's something we heard last week, and we're going to hear it all month. The audience is the hero. The audience is the king. That, that's what you need to fanatically focus on, that you do not want to create generic presentations. You want to know who you're talking to, and you want to make presentations that specifically uh, tickle their fancy, answer their needs, fulfill their desires. And so you have to know enough about your audience to know what they're looking for or what they will be motivated by. So think about the audience. We're going to keep hearing that. Can't hear it enough. Second thing, move people, spread ideas. And this is, again, part of why we think learning how to make presentations is important. This is the way creative people get together and make decisions happen really fast. Sometimes you can't just say, I want to do this. That makes you seem like a dictator. But in order to have consensus, you've got to have everyone sort of understand all the facts. And that's why a presentation is telling a story. This 
beginning, middle, and end thing of telling a story is laying out an issue and making sure people understand what the relevant thing uh, things to think about are or the things that could impact the decision are and guiding the audience through that and then coming to that conclusion. The takeaway is this is our thinking of why we should make this decision. And because presentations can be condensed, because you can do this in three minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, you can get through uh, a complex issue very quickly and come to a resolution. And that's what creative people want. They don't want to get hung up forever waiting for decisions to be made. You want to think, move things ha fast. So move people, spread ideas, presentations, make things happen in a hurry. And because we're all visual, creative people, you want to help them see what you're saying. You're going to use your voice, your words, to explain everything. But because you want that audience to be on uh, the same wavelength as you, you want to use the slides to help them understand your words. The combination of what you say and what you're showing them on the slides, the, the text and the visuals, the, the various um, uh, graphic uh, information that you put on the slides should be there to help them understand what you mean, to, to see what you're saying. And then sometimes it won't be a gestalt kind of thing, but you do want to have good slides. And that's why another dictum is practice design, not decoration. Remember always that the slides are not pretty pictures, they're information. They are information in the same way the words you're speaking are information. So they should be relevant. When I ask you to put visual imagery into your paper last week, I didn't want you to go grab some random image. I wanted you to put an image in that was relevant to what you were saying. So that as I was reading your review and then looking at that image, I would have more information, more awareness of what was going on. Now, oftentimes you guys would grab a screen grab from uh, from the video, and that's absolutely relevant. Oftentimes you would show me the presenter. Well, you're focused on, focused on telling me how this presenter did. I certainly want to see them. I certainly want to have that visual image and know that I'm part of that situation. So you guys were choosing appropriate images to go into those documents. And that's exactly what you're going to do when you create slides. That if the slide doesn't have something new to say, it should at least be presenting information that's relevant and in sync with what I'm saying. And so that is uh, visuals as design, not as decoration. Uh, another thing, cultivate healthy relationships. When you're giving a presentation, there are a number of different relationships that happen. If you are a speaker and you have slides behind you, then there's a relationship between what you're saying and what's on the screen behind you. Or even if you're creating this as a video, there's a relationship between the voice on the soundtrack and the visuals on the screen. And the uh, relationship between that visual and that image, that sync, is something that the audience is constantly uh, experiencing and um, moving through. There's also a relationship between you as the presenter and the audience. Are you saying things that make sense to them? Are you talking uh, on their level? Oftentimes it's about um, making a uh, common bond. So maybe there's a way that you speak that tells them that you understand them or that you're part of their group or their culture. So the different relationships that are going on during a presentation are things that are going to happen anyway. And there are things that you can think about before you start to do that presentation. I mean, certainly, if you, uh, uh, if you made a um, presentation about surfing and then you showed up at the auditorium and everybody there was a cowboy and you felt weird talking about surfing or making surfing jokes when everyone in there was in interested in cowboys and horses and ranching, well, 
Maybe you should have known who that audience was ahead of time. Cultivating relationships is about making sure ahead of time that that uncomfortable fit doesn't happen. That's what happens when you make a for whom it's concerned kind of presentation, and then you just show up, and then you experience what happens. So we're trying to get you to the point where in creating the presentation in the first place, if you know that it's for a particular audience, we're going to do enough research about that audience that you know exactly what you have to say to them, what will work, what will affect them, how you can create those bonds. So another one of the really important chapters that you're going to read in uh, Slideology is about the presentation ecosystem. Now, most of you are going into creative fields that have very established production models. If you're going into filmmaking, uh, the production model is very well known. Pre-production, people are writing scripts, you're doing casting. Production, you go out in the world and you shoot with a camera. Post-production, you come back and you edit that footage and then, that, then you have a finished movie. Um, that's the old model when, when uh, uh, filming was, was disconnected from editing because there were no computers. Now everything's digital, so the act of production and the act of post-production sometimes gets, gets quite commingled because it's on the same computer. The same computer that's recording your video is, is editing it as well. So uh, they're not necessarily distinct periods, but they are distinct processes, and you need to learn that production model. And whether you're in the audio field which still, again, has a pre-production phase, ideas, writing them down, writing songs, writing parts. There's a recording phase where you're playing songs, you're, you're uh, gathering sounds and so forth. There's a production or post-production phase where you're putting all that music together. Uh, video games, same way. So this production model extends to presentations, and Nancy... Uh, Duarte has explained it in this chapter. So she breaks it down that there are three main tracks. She calls the message, visual story, and delivery. And each one of these tracks has their own component pieces. So I want to go through them very briefly. Message is the content that you're creating. And of course, in creating that message, the very first thing you need to do is figure out the audience. Figure out who you're talking to, uh, and to some extent, delivery impacts upon this because where do, what are the conditions or how are you going to reach that audience? But in creating the message, you really just need to know who they are. Uh, what common links do you have? What are they interested in? What, what, what goals do they have? How are you going to capture their imagination? So once you know who you're talking to, you need to start figuring out what you want to say. And that's a phase that we call ideation. This might be a word that you've never heard before, but it's a very common word. It's, it's a sister word to creation. You know that creation is the act of creating. Ideation is the act of generating ideas. Now, we typically call this brainstorming. That's a great term. You know, uh, it, 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 it's kind of visual. It means that your, your, your brain is so overheated that it's creating a hurricane. Everybody knows what brainstorming is, but essentially, if you break it down, ideation is a better word because it's just generating ideas. And there is a process that you need to go through in the creation of a message. And one of the things that we want to do is generate lots of ideas. So in the brainstorming phase, there are actually rules for brainstorming. We're going to go through it a little bit later, but you want to keep generating ideas. You don't want to cut off brainstorming or ideation too early because you cut yourself off from a creative flow of things. Uh, you, you know, if you take the first idea that comes into your head, you may not have the best idea. If you get started too early, you may not have enough content figured out to get you through the entire presentation. So a, a, a brainstorming phase should generate lots of material, ideally more material than you can actually put into the presentation so that you then can go through uh, a writing and editing phase. You take all those gen general ideas and you figure out what's the best ideas. You start to put them in order. You start to craft a narrative. You start to write a script, a voiceover script, to figure out what you want to say. And uh, in writing, lots of people work in different ways. Some people write scripts. Some people just write notes. 
Some people just uh, improvise and, 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 and say it out loud several times. There's no one process. Everybody who's creative has to kind of figure out their best way. But for most of us, writing down what you have to say is very much um, a great way to go. Because if you just start recording from notes or trying to improvise, you cannot keep on task. And your actual assignment uh, that you're going to have this month has a time target. So you can't go on forever and you can't, can't do too short. You're trying to hit a certain amount of content. And writing your words out can actually translate to a timing. Uh, once you get used to reading what you've written, you can look at a page of content and say, look at a single page and say, oh, that's about a minute or a minute and a half. And if I, if I need to go three minutes, that's two full pages or whatever. Now, all, uh, this, this, completely, this metric completely changes with how big you space it or, or what type size you use. But whatever your common writing style is, what, however you lay things out, you can start to have a real good handle on how long you're going to be speaking by how many words you put together. And so uh, writing what you have to say uh, has a lot of advantages. It means that you can rehearse it. It means that you can get used to it. Um, the, the, the big uh, cheat that most people do that we want to get out of is writing it and then go straight into recording it. Do not ever record something that you've never read aloud. Just because you wrote it and you think you know what's in there, saying it out loud is quite different. Uh, your mind knows what's in that on that piece of paper, but your tongue doesn't know it yet. So you want to say these things out loud. And sometimes when you're uh, when you write something and then you speak it out loud for the first time, you figure out that oh, I've written a phrase that's kind of hard for me to say, or maybe I use a better word, etc. So saying it out loud is, uh, without recording it, is part of the creative process. And, and then that makes you more familiar. And, uh, you know, a couple of rehearsals will make you even better. But uh, it's always obvious when someone is reading something that uh, for the very first time on a recording. And the second time you do it, it's better. The third time it's even better. So we're going to get into this process of making sure we've done our work enough that we're going to have the best recording that we can and give ourselves the best chance for success. The second track is visual story. And again, this pretty much uh, means the slides. What's on the screen if you're creating a movie, what's on the, uh, the screen behind you if you're doing a, a live presentation, etc. Uh, these are the, the PowerPoint slides or the, uh, the canvas of the video. And again, people work in lots of different ways. Uh, the pre-production visual thinking aspect of this. Some people like to draw storyboards. Some people create mood boards. You can just go out and grab bunches of images and types, uh, bits of type and, and uh, uh, different color combinations and, and different kinds of things that will set you in a mood to understanding what you have to do. And then also, you have to figure out ways of creating metaphor. You have oftentimes complex information that you have to relate to an audience and very often there's something that you could talk about for a hundred words but if you put the right two images together you might only have to say 10 words so you're really looking for a visual metaphor that's going to make people understand and that's what we mean by visual thinking you guys are all creative people Creative people earn their living because they can do what other people who aren't creative can't. So you need to get good at these kinds of skills. And in this particular case, the idea of the right image that tells the story, the right image that explains what you're thinking, that lets them see what you're saying, is very important. And oftentimes... Um, it's, it's a matter of fitting it to who you are. Quite often, if we start off with PowerPoint um, and we're not really invested in what we're doing, we might create a PowerPoint in which at some point where maybe we're talking about a tree. And you just say, well, I just need a tree on this slide. So you'll go to you know, Microsoft Clip Art or, or Google Images and you'll just grab the first image that you find. It's usually a cartoon image and you'll say, oh, that's fine. So if you don't care, yeah, that is fine. 
You're talking about a tree. Oh, there's a tree. What does it matter? Well, it matters because for you as a creative artist, you want to have the right impact. And if the audience sees a cartoon image, then it maybe means this isn't that important. But if you've taken the time to find just the right image, or you've expressed your own personal style, you are a creative artist and you maybe have drawn something original or maybe just found an, a photograph that is the correct expression not only of the idea but the mood and the intent, then that kicks it up a level. It tells the audience that you are more invested in this than the person who just drew a cartoon. So visual thinking is an expression of um, intent and seriousness, and it makes the audience respond in a like way. Now, there's another aspect of visual thinking I want you to think about, and that is that oftentimes what you're needed to do is to explain complex elements or the, tell a story about data. That often means things like charts and graphs or infographics. Uh, the ability to give someone a context for what a lot of information means is, an, uh, is a very important talent. And if you can do that, if you can explain complex ideas to people so that they all understand it, and we're talking about, as you guys go into the business world, you know, it could be mu very much kind of um, interpreting data. You know, uh, you're at a company and they discovered that they show, they sold more purple shoes in, Can in Kansas than pink shoes in Illinois. What does that mean? Well, if you can interpret that data and you can explain it to the other people in the room and you can make recommendations and says, this is the next thing we should do. This is the next product we should sell. You become very, very valuable and you making other people understand they all had access to the same data, but you made them all understand something new about it. So that's a very important skill and it's something that you're going to work on while you're here at uh, Full Sail and you will get better at it. Some of you will take to it. Some of you will consider that not your your primary area, but it's something that you'll all have to consider. Uh, graphic design enters into this. Now, I know some of you are coming here to become graphic designers. Some of you are here to do completely opposite things. You want to be a creative writer. You want to be uh, an audio engineer. But graphic design is a way of speaking clearly and simply. And so, we don't expect you all to become graphic de designers, but in thinking about what kind of presentation you should make, we want you all to get enough uh, rudimentary or basic graphic design skills down so that you can talk in a common language. And that's why we, we're, we're really we're talking about symbols and things. Um, if you think about um, signage, Think about driving down the highway and uh, the signs on the highway. You're going down that highway 60, 70, sometimes 80 miles an hour, even more if you shouldn't be. And you don't have much more than a split second to see what that sign is saying and understand it. And so the people that design those signs rely on symbols. They rely on uh, clean design, good type, contrast. Uh, forms, color, things that people can understand very quickly in order that they're not confusing you. If you made too confusing a sign and put it on the side of the road, you could cause wrecks because people would divert their attention trying to figure out what you were trying to say while they were doing another very difficult task. So the slides that you create that go through in time as you're talking should have that same kind of ethos. You've got a little bit more time, and you can't can't cause anybody to wreck while they're in a seat, but you should think about how much time it takes for someone to unpack a complex image. I know you may feel like, oh, I want to make this um, photo collage of six different images, 
but how much time is it going to take for the audience to unpack those six images and make sense of it? And how much time of that are they taking away from listening to you as you're communicating to them on the voice? And wouldn't it be more uh, effective to perhaps sh create six slides that go by in a hurry and let people absorb those images through time rather than making a complex image. So those are the kinds of um, notions of graphic design that we want you to think about. We want you to think about what works on a screen and, 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 and how much white space there should be and when is something too cluttered. Another aspect that we want to think, you to think about is motion design. Now, I'll bet the first thing most of you consider when I say motion design and you're thinking about PowerPoint are those 10 million transitions that PowerPoint throws in there for free. But I really want you to stay away from those. The problem is a transition happens between slides and it really has nothing to do with your message. It's just eye candy. And when I say motion design is important, I don't really talk about eye candy. I'm talking about using the element of time to make people understand something better. For instance, and you'll see examples of this in some of the, the presentations that I, I do here, uh, I might have a, a slide up that purposefully will have five or six uh, bullet points. But usually when I do it, I don't bring on that slide with all five bullet points showing. Because you know what happens? I, uh, if, I, if I brought that on immediately, you'd start reading ahead. And while I might need to go through those bullet points, instead of having the slide be on there for 20 seconds with all five bullet points on for the entire 20 seconds, what will happen is people start reading ahead and getting out of sync with me. But with motion design, I can start with a blank screen or start with just the very first bullet point and slide in each bullet point in sync as I'm speaking it. Because the more you can keep the audience in sync with what you're saying and making sure that the visual is right on point, the more the audience stays with you, the more they're interested in your message, the more they're keeping up with your tempo. So simple motion design. Even when you're putting several images together, like here's, here's a plate, I've got an image on the left, an image on the right. I've got a, a graphic in the center and, and a text on it. Well, I'm going to do the same thing. Watch how it bring it in slightly different timing. First you see the image, then you see the overlay. It doesn't take very long, but it, lasts, it allows you to see the in full image and then understand the context that these things are going in. That kind of simple motion design will help the audience stay in the flow, whereas a transition that blows some fireworks up in between slides doesn't really necessarily speak to you. Now, uh, sometimes you're going to find a topic that you might talk on and a set of transitions that will match. Let's say you're talking about water and you maybe have water ripples as transitions. That will thematically match and might work. But for the most part, you're going to find that the simpler the transition between slides, the better off you are. A cut or quick dissolve makes you uh, get into the content much faster. The third leg of the ecosystem is delivery. This is the, this is the conditions in which your audience experiences your presentation. And this is where things have become very different from days of yore. That we're not in the TED Talk world anymore. Uh, TED Talks still happen. You guys may end up, uh, you know, speaking to people face to face in a theater, uh, but that will be rarer and rarer. Uh, certainly, probably more likely to be speaking to someone uh, on the theater of a church than in a, a, a full theater. But these, can, these kinds of presentations happen anywhere and everywhere. So from a small conference room, that's still human face-to-face -face contact. So um, those of you that had a, have a chance someday to come to Full Sail on campus, you will actually experience doing presentations face-to-face -face in front of an audience. Uh, other first-month students who come to Full Sail and are taking this very same class, they are doing live presentations in front of their classmates. But because this is an online class, we only get 
the aspect of the voice as our human contact. Now, that doesn't preclude you from putting yourself on cam camera if you wish to. So you still can film yourself uh, and be on camera for the audience. But uh, we don't ask that of anybody because we're trying to put less pressure on people, not more. If we said you had to go on camera, everybody would freak out. Now, some people love it. Some people are going to find it very easy. And you're going to find out that I'm actually going to recommend for you to do it this this week because I, uh, we have a, a really fun discussion that I'm going to talk about. But the main aspect of human communication that you're going to be engaged in for this assignment in this class is your voice. That's the instrument in which you're going to connect with your fellow student. But uh, in the long run, eye contact, body movement, all those other uh, physical aspects and attributes that you saw the people in the TED Talks working on are the things that you yourself have available to you to communicate with. And those are important to think about. And as you're creating a presentation and you know the circumstances of delivery, you will know that you have to engage in this. Uh, if you know you're delivering something live in front of an audience and it's important, you'll not only think about what you're going to say and how your voice is going to be, but what are you going to wear? How are you going to stand? Are you going to be in front of a podium or are you going to walk around? Because if you know those circumstances, you want to plan them out ahead of time. You don't ever want to be caught off guard by just simply tripping into the circumstance. You want to plan everything. So knowing where the presentation is going to happen tells you how you can use your human uh, uh, human to human contact to best effect. But for the most part, in the digital world, we're going to be speaking to people through intermediated devices. We're going to be talking to people on our computers, our phones. You're going to be, have uh, things that are transferred through YouTube or sent in various different ways. So we have to think about those circumstances and we have to think about how does our presentation look in those circumstances. And one of the things I want all of you thinking about this month, you're all probably using your laptop to create your presentation. Your laptop is probably a 13 or 15 inch screen. That's one size. And if you were thinking about going into a, a live auditorium, it would get projected on a screen, so it would go even bigger. But if you put it on YouTube or something, a certain amount of people will look at it on their computers, but a lot more people will look at it on their phones. So how will your uh, presentation look on a phone? One of the things we want to plan for is the scalability of our presentation. As we're working, we want to say, does this image scale up? Does this image scale down? Is the type I'm using too small for when we, someone looks at it on the phone? Does it look good blown up? So you want to be thinking about the variable circumstances as part of the act of creation. And in the future, we don't know that what kind of new devices are coming along. People are working on augmented reality and, and, and uh, minority uh, report type giant interactive screens. So there may be a whole new generation of devices that you guys have to design for. And that's something that you think about. How is the audience going to experience the work that I'm creating? And so, uh, again, it is about thinking through their eyes that most of your planning should occur. And the final aspect of uh, delivery is a word that's going to sound funny in this context, we call it paper, and that's maybe an archaic term. Uh, paper referred to if you were in a live live venue and your presentation ran as a time art for, for five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, it's eventually going to be over. And after it was over, what would happen? So the term paper uh, is better regarded as a lead behind. Once the presentation ends, how do you continue the conversation? If you're there live and you're there at a TED Talk uh, type event or uh, even in a conference room, you'd have the ability to maybe to hand out a brochure or leave your business card or give some kind of physical permanent reminder of what had been said so that you can extend that presentation uh, with an after event. Uh, in the uh, digital world, you need to think about what are the circumstances that people are viewing my piece on. 
And you need to think about what is around that. Uh, I, there are different words for it. I tend to call it the Chrome. What is on that web page? What is on that device beyond the uh, presentation space? So if you were on YouTube, there's maybe a, a, a title area and there's a comments area, et cetera. So there'd be a chance for you to put your name or maybe your Twiddle hander, Twiddle ha Twitter handle or an email address or some way to get a hold of you uh, so that people could extend the conversation. Maybe give out your phone number or, or something like that. So even in the digital world, you want to create the leave behind. You want to figure out once the video stops playing uh, or the presentation stops playing, how do people get a hold of you? How do people contact you? Mail to links uh, can, can work as well. Now, sometimes you might want to put this into the presentation itself, but it's usually a, uh, uh, a good idea to figure out some way that it happens in the frame around it. And that's why we call that a leap behind or paper. So that's the presentation ecosystem. Built into each uh, one of those three channels is the opportunity for critique or self-reflection at each phase of the production process. You work on it, you get the chance to say, is this right? Before you go on to the next phase, can I make this better? Does this work? Is this doing what I'm intended to do? It? So we're gonna, we're gonna uh, work critique into our process as well. So this week, we're gonna plan a presentation. Next week, we're gonna create a presentation. And in week four, we're gonna revise that presentation based on feedback that we receive uh, both from me and from your peers. So that's the process we're working on this month. So this is the planning phase. I'm about to tell you what your presentation is about, and we're going to get started on it. Uh, and the first thing that we're doing this week is we're creating a plan for that presentation. So this is a brainstorming phase. You're creating a document with all the ideas that you're going to think about before you actually start creating the plan, uh, creating the presentation itself. So this is a pre-production document. So as you're brainstorming, these are the guides, these are the rules for brainstorming. Rule number one, postpone and withhold your judgment of ideas. So lots of times people just start thinking about something and the first time they find something they like, they stop, they go on, they move forward, they just keep, uh, they, they just say, well, that's good enough. But if you're actually going through this process, forcing yourself to keep thinking beyond that first time you say, well, that's not a bad idea, but keep generating more ideas because it's very important. Um, it's a process and your brain works in a, a kind of a, a log jam fashion. And once you loosen one thing, sometimes there's a torrent of ideas and you've closed yourself off to it too early, you're missing the best part. So. You don't want to shut that down too quick. Postpone and withhold your judgment. Rule number two, this is where we're encouraging wild, exaggerated ideas. Sometimes something's too crazy, but in the planning phase, in the idea phase, it doesn't hurt to think of it. it this is the time where you just sort of go crazy in your head, uh, you know, the notion of going outside the box. What is a, a, an odd idea I'd like to do? Because in in elaborating that odd, crazy idea, you may then uh, come up with some actual uh, per, uh, creatable version uh, of something else. So the wild idea maybe can't happen, but the idea after that may be just the right idea. Rule number three, quantity counts at this stage. So I can't emphasize this enough. I want you to generate a lot of ideas. I know students just like to, to do, always do the bare minimum. And if you just come up with three things and you think, well, that's enough, I brainstormed and move on. I want you to keep generating a lot of material. I want you to give me plans with lots of ideas on them. More than you can actually do because that makes you wealthy. It lets you throw things away. If you don't have enough ideas to get through your whole presentation, your presentation will start to feel weak. It's like that guy with only four strands of hair and he combs them over like he, he has a full head, but everybody knows it's a comb over. If you don't have enough ideas, it will show. And by generating ideas ahead of time, more than you can actually use, you become wealthy in the creative. 
And you can then pick and choose the good ones and throw the other ones away, or, or better yet, save them for another time. Now, these next two uh, ideas don't necessarily apply in this instance because you're all working alone. But for most of you, you're going to go out into the working world and you're going to be on creative teams. And when you work on projects, you're going to brainstorm together with groups of people, people uh, who are your colleagues. And there are rules for that as well. Rule number four, build on the ideas put forth by others. So when you're brainstorming together, someone says something that spurs something in you, put it out there. Don't hide it. Uh, you're, you're all making each other better. So uh, there's a real energy that happens when people brainstorm together and when people build off each other's ideas. And it has to do with camaraderie and not uh, being proprietary about, that's my idea. You're a team. You want the team to succeed. And that leads to rule number five. Every idea and every person has equal worth. So this is that notion of professionalism. If someone is there working with you, they deserve to be there. They deserve to be heard. Same as you. And so when someone says something, you're not really uh, in a brainstorming session. You're not necessarily worrying about who's got a particular uh, title in the job. The best idea can win because the team wins. Now, does that happen always in the real world? No, at some point, the boss is going to claim the credit. But in a real creative team, you generate an energy and everyone feeds off each other and everyone respects each other. And that is the best creative time you've ever had. And it's part of the process and you need to learn to be part of that process. Uh, and you're going to earn the respect of your peers. So another thing we're thinking about is what are we doing to inspire ourselves and others? And how do we connect with other people? So the first thing you want to ask is, how do I get inspired? What, what makes me you know, feel really uh, uh, amazing? Well, some people are into movies. Some people are into art. Some people are into reading. Some people are into video games. Some people are into music, etc. We are going to have a discussion this week in which each one of us shares our passions. And we're going to do it in a really creative way. I'm going to force you to go ahead and make a little short mini presentation as your discussion. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. But, uh, well, we'll talk about it now. So if you haven't read that far in the instructions, uh, this week the uh, discussion is called Emotional Storytelling. And your initial post, which, again, everyone should have done by Wednesday... But if you don't have it done by Wednesday, it's okay. Don't fret if you don't get it in by Wednesday, even though you, uh, I know the system is now sending out reminders. And, you know, it's good to have a reminder, but no one's going to uh, go to prison if it's not done by Wednesday. But I think most of you are fine that you're able to. But our initial post is not a written post this time. So uh, we have a fairly elaborate set of instructions here, and I want to make sure everybody goes through them. So emotional storytelling what we want you to do is to, feign, uh, to think of a work of art that really moved you and tell us about the circumstances in which it moved you. You're telling us a story about how you encountered a work of art that had a real meaning in your life. And what you want to do is transfer that passion that you have to us as your audience. So the first thing we want you to do is figure out how do you talk to other people so they want to listen? And that's a TED Talk we have here by Julian Treasure. So I want everyone to watch this video. It's not that long. It's amazing. And Julian Treasure tells us about how you can speak authentically from the heart and have other people really connect with you. So he mentions two concepts here. Uh, he's going to talk about them, so I don't need to go into it in too much detail. But he mentions a concept that he calls HAIL. H-A-I-L. HAIL stands for honesty, authenticity, integrity, and love. And he means that when you listen to someone speak, by the way that they speak, you can tell if they're being honest with you, if they're being authentic with you, if, if they're speaking you know, what they believe, and if they have a true passion. That comes through in your voice. 
Now, how does it come through in your voice? Well, he mentions another thing, the vocal toolbox. Each of us have the ability to control our voice in a way that communicates to others. And it communicates in a certain emotionality. And there's a number of tools you can use. You can use the pitch of your voice. You can talk high or low. You can talk fast or slow. You can have dramatic pauses. There's a toolbox that allows you to control the way your voice tells the story. And that's something I want you guys to think about and play with this month, this week. As you're telling us about this work of art, I want you to convince us that it's important to you. Now, should you be constantly thinking about that? No, I want you to watch this video, think about it, absorb it, and then immerse yourself in your topic. Tell us that story. So the task, if you read the instructions here, is pick your favorite work or piece of art. This can be a movie, a song, a video game, a painting, a sculpture, a book, whatever. Choose one you feel emotionally connected to. Using your, your choice as the subject, create a two to three minute audiovisual project. So we're not writing something down. We're not doing a written post. We're creating an audio file that tells the story in two to three minutes. And some of the prompts to think about, when did you first encounter this work of art? What emotional effect did it have on you? Why is it your favorite? What does it inspire you to do? You don't have to answer each one of these things. There's just things to think about. So what I've tried to do here is give you a sample of some examples that people are can do. So the first example is using a webcam. That's an easy thing. If most of you have a computer, most of you have a video camera on it. So uh, the easiest way to record might just be to turn it on and talk directly into it. If you feel like going on camera, you do not have to be on camera. The only requirement this week is that you create a piece of audio. But sometimes people will want to just use their webcam to do it, and it, that's the easiest way. So if you turn on your webcam. So Superman the movie. Uh, that movie was made in, or was released in 1978. I think the first time I actually sat down and watched that movie, uh, I had to have been like five or six years old in that time area. Now, aside from things like great acting performances and casting, amazing technological leaps and bounds and filmmaking, having basically three separate movies in one single movie, aside from those things that I, that I would generally say are reasons why it's my favorite movie, the reason that I feel such an emotional connection to it um, goes back to my dad. All right, so you can see that Andrew here has just talked to his webcam and recorded it. And that's fine. That's all you need to do. Now, you can also see that Andrew knew how to edit video, and he's cut a lot of clips in here. If you know how to do this, feel free to do it. If you've never done it before, and that's a, a technical obstacle to you, I do not want that. I do not want you struggling with technology you don't know how to do. I think all of you, if you have a webcam, know how to stand in front of it and talk. So I'm very happy for you to create a video in which you don't do any inserts and you just simply talk. That is a perfect representation. Now, be aware that if you put yourself on camera, you're, you're responsible for everything that happens. So I don't want to see your dog walking around or your, your kids in the background, you know, uh, photobombing you. Uh, I, I don't want to see uh, anything that you don't want me to see. You're responsible for the entire screen. Um, but if you go on camera, you have the ability to, in addition to your vocal toolbox, give use your uh, hands and face for eye to eye uh, human connection. And that's much more expressive. And it's easy to do. All you need to do is create a video. You can post it to YouTube and link it back, or you can export it as a digital file. We'll talk about turning in the file in just a second. But this is an easy thing for most of you to do. If you feel like being on camera, you can. If you don't want to be on camera, you don't have to. Uh, if you just want to record, you could record the video and, and, and export the audio. But here's an example of audio only. Now, there are several ways to do audio only. We have some audio programs. Most of you have microphones. You can also use your, uh, your cell phones to do this, your smartphones. But here's an example. All I'm looking for, this is 
doesn't have to have visuals. This is an audio file, uh, someone encountering a Bruce Springsteen song for the first time. I remember getting to work a little late that day. I don't remember why I was late. Maybe I had an errand to take care of on the way to work, or I was just running behind. Do you tell? You see, he's telling us a story. Doesn't really. It's not doing formulaic. He's not doing question and answer. He's telling us a story. It's an emotional story. He's encountered this song. It has an effect on him. He tells me what's going on. Now, here's another great example. Uh, those of you that don't necessarily know uh, which technology you want to use. I'm going to recommend something called Adobe Spark. If you click on this link, it'll take you to their website. Adobe has um, free online software that will allow you to record your voice and add pictures or video to it. And they have a lot of uh, pre-made art that you can use as well. So it's very simple to use. But here's an example of a video that someone made using that. I think we all can agree that middle school is pretty awkward. It's filled with awkward preteens in their awkward bodies, navigating their awkward social cliques. But despite all of that awkwardness, it's in these fragile middle school years that children really begin to piece together who they are and what they care about. It's in middle school where self-esteem seems to be teetering on a tightrope, waiting for a strong gust of wind to push it to one side or the other. And this issue of self-esteem was no different for me. It was in middle school that I realized that I did not fit in with the other girls in my class. I was all about basketball while they were all about nail polish. I hated skirts, but they were all into skirts. The effort that it takes to put on makeup depresses me, but the time crunch never seemed to bother the other girls in my grade. I knew that the things that my peers were turning to was not authentic to me, but I still felt the pressure to conform. I was a tomboy, and in many ways I still am. And in middle school, that can be difficult to grapple with. I didn't fit into the socially constructed definition of a girl. I never got the guy. I never dressed up. I hate wearing heels. But one thing I did know was that I was in love with the game of basketball. It was in the seventh grade when I first saw what would become my all-time favorite movie, Love and Basketball. It was finally a movie for the... So I let this sample play a little bit long to let you know that sometimes you need to set up your story for a little while. To Took her halfway through before she mentions the movie. That's fine. It's the process of telling a story. There's no one way to tell a story, but I think if if you watch these three examples, you will see uh, what we mean by emotional storytelling. People are picking a work of art. It means something to them. They're telling us what their personal experience was, and they're spreading that passion. And any way that you want to tell that story. Now, I want you to try to do it in two to three minutes. And by the instructions, we say, want you to create what we're calling an audio-visual project, which means that you can use video, you can use audio only. There's, um, uh, we, there's a free audio program that you can put on your computer called Audacity that we recommend that you can download if you want to use the microphone on your computer. If you want to use your cell phone, uh, you can... Speak it as an audio memo and email it to yourself. So you can use the, the, uh, the microphone on your smartphone, whether you have an Android phone or a, a, an iPhone, is usually a really high quality microphone. So all you need to do is really speak out loud and hold the phone about three or four inches from your face and you'll get a really good recording. And you probably have a timer on it so it'll know, tell you how long you're going and so on and so forth. And if you don't like it, you can just trash it and do it over again do multiple takes but when you get a file that you like then we want you to upload that file so one of the issues is turning in the file we are experiencing this brand new interface and it doesn't have everything we used to have it's it's very nice what you see here that you see the the videos are in line the audio audio plays in line etc well in our brand new discussion board they haven't put media in yet which means all we can do is attach our files. So when you go to make your post, you're going to have a video file or an audio file, and you're just going to upload it. Um, essentially, let me come back here just a second. When you come in to create a post, uh, uh, create a post, you have the ability to attach files down below. So all I need you to do when you 
when you want to turn in your file is uh, write a few sentences. You don't have to write anything very elaborate, but maybe set us up or tell us what movie it is or, or what kind of media it is or, or when you encounter it or whatever you want to say to set it up <clears throat> and then hit attach files. And if you want to turn in a video file or um, uh, an audio file, you can attach it there. And if you want to link to an external source, like you put it on YouTube, all you need to do is put the link to YouTube in here. And here's another thing I want to uh, show you. Let me make a, a link really quick. Uh, this isn't a real link, but I'm just going to make a fake one. Um, when you put a link in, uh, it's just text. So you have to, what we call, activate it. So if you select it, when you select it in this text box, you get an up overlay here. And when you go to this little set of, of, of links here, you get the ability to put the link in. So here is where you can have it play a new tab and you'll have to put the link in as well. So if you're cutting and pasting a link, cut it, cut it into the, uh, or paste it into the window and then select it and paste it back into this window so that uh, if I had just copied that, I, I could have done the same thing. So by copying that into that window and setting it to play in another tab and hitting collect, you can now see that it's an activated tab. So if you're linking into a third party source, you've put it on uh, SoundCloud or you put it on YouTube or, or Vimeo or something like that, uh, or even if you create it on Adobe Spark, you can leave something on the Adobe Spark website and link over to it, or you can download the file. Adobe Spark will allow you to do both. But when you uh, then create an activated link, it will play in the uh, interface. But in this case, you can see I've created a link for everybody. Uh, figured I should do this assignment the same as you. So you have to click and download these files to hear them. Now I'm saying this because it's uh, we, we have not only a requirement for everyone to make an initial post and your attachments are going to be your initial post, your attachment or your link, but everyone has to come back and respond to two more classmates. You all did that last week. You're really good at it. But in order to respond, you're going to need to download people's media and listen to it and then come back and make comments. So uh, <clears throat> once people start populating this with their assignments, you can come back and start looking through what people put in. So I included a movie poster, and I, I did a, a, a short audio piece about a, a film that I really liked. So uh, that's an example that I, I put in there for you. Uh, so you have a couple of examples to look at. You do not have to have visuals, but even if you do audio only, it's often a good idea to throw in an image to help us see what you're saying, because that's what we're learning to do this month. So um, that's that the, uh, assignment. And again, we'd like you to try to get your audio visual piece in by Wednesday. So this is probably something you'll want to get started on while you're doing the reading. Uh, Last week, it was important for you to get the reading done before you uh, started to do the TED Talk uh, assignment. This week, you could probably do them in parallel. So my recommendation in terms of uh, planning your week out is get started on this project first and get it out of the way. And as soon as you're done with this, then start working on the, uh, the main assignment. The main assignment is this week, planning a presentation. And that's where we're going to get started on our presentation. And that's due on Sunday. So you can be doing the reading and uh, uh, finishing this at the same time. So uh, I believe, yeah, I don't need that anymore. Um, so let's go to the main assignment here, planning presentation. I've not yet told you what your presentation is about. I'm going to give you all the topic right now. And you can see that it's right here in bold type. Your plan is to pitch yourself to a future employer. You must address all the following in detail. So everyone's presentation is about yourself, your brand, 
after graduation. Everyone is going to be talking to their dream employer. After you get out of school, you learn what you've come to full sail to do. And you, uh, for some of you, you're going to go straight to your dream job. So for some of you, it may be a few years after graduation. But you all need to decide where you would ideally like to work. And you're going to give me a plan for that. So the very first thing that all of you are figuring out is who is your audience. And in this case, when I say audience, I don't mean me. I'm. You're not making this for me. You're going to make this for a presentation to your dream company. So when you're, I say your target audience, figure out who would you like to work for. Would you like to work for Pixar? Would you like to work for uh, Blizzard? Would you like to work for... Uh, uh, Warner Brother movies, whoever it is that is your dream company that you'd like to work for in your chosen field, I want you to figure out, make a presentation to sell yourself and your skills. Now, this is an act of imagination. You're not talking about the person you are right now. You're talking about the person you're going to become after graduation. You have all these skills. You've done all these things. So, the plan that you're going to make for me this week is to figure out what dream job you're going for, and you're going to tell me who that is. I want you to be very specific. I do not want generalizations. Oh, I'd like to speak to a record company. Which record company? What type of music? What area of the country? Be as specific as you can because it's important. I want you to have those people in your brain as you're creating this presentation. So for each of you, you're going to have a completely separate audience that you choose yourself. But in your plan, you need to tell me who that audience is. And the more specific you are, the better off you are. The better you're going to please me. I, if, you, if you can name the company, better. If you can't name the company, tell me exactly what type of company, what it is they do, what level they work at, uh, you know, where, where do they exist, what do they create. Uh, so tell me as much about this company as you can. Uh, the other thing, I, the next thing I want you to know is what is your true message? What is it you're saying to them about who you are and what you want to do? So for each of you, you're going to in a in a three to four minute presentation, you're going to tell them who you are, what skills you have, and why they should hire you as as their employee. You're telling us the story of you. So this is about a story, a presentation flow. I want to know what's in the beginning, middle, and end. So for all of you, you're going to say, I began by watching video games, and I just knew that I had to become a video game designer. And, and by the time I was 15, I knew the cheat codes to everything, etc. And then go on and tell me. And you're going to tell me about your full cell education in the past tense. So if you don't know what classes you're going to be taking in the next... 30 months, now is a great time to find out. You can find out from the Full Sail website. Uh, anybody that needs to know what their classes are, if you go to Full Sail, on the Full Sail website, all you have to do is choose your degree program. So let's say you want to study uh, art and design. We'll look up the degree programs. And at the bottom of each degree program, you, we're going to choose Computer Animation Bachelors. There is a listing of all the courses. Uh, see a full listing of all the courses in the Computer Degree Program. So now here you can know what's every class you're going to be taking. You're all here, month one, create a presentation. Uh, and this, I think, is the campus view I, I just picked it random if you pick the online view it it would have a different stepping but there's a listing of all the classes so for anything anybody wants to pick uh, music recording uh, music production bachelors online Full listing. Oh, here it is online. So you just switch it over. Here's where you are. Create a presentation. 
this is what you're going to be taking in the next 32 months. And you can click in and, and see more about it. So if you don't know what classes you're going to be taking, now's a good time to do research. This is a week of research and planning. So if you don't know much about the companies you're interested in, research them. We can go online. We can find out what companies there are in your field. We can find out who, uh, you, you, maybe you have a favorite video game, but you don't know who made it. Well, we can research and find out what that company is and where they are and, and uh, how many people they hire and what, what, what jobs they want. But I want you to fill all this information in. There are five different topics here. Who is your future self? Tell me how you're unique. People always say these generic things like, oh, I'm a, I'm a, a, a self-starter. I have a good attitude. I'm a team player. Well, everybody is that way. What is unique about you? Think about what it is that you have to offer. Do you have a particular perspective? Do you have a particular sound in your head? Do you have stories to tell? This is the time to bring that out and highlight what is unique about you. That's your brand. Uh, and then finally, what star moments do you think you would include in this presentation? So I want you to create a document for me that's going to tell me who is your target audience, what is your true message, who is your future self, tell Tell me your presentation flow, the story that you're telling. And I specifically want everybody to include the beginning, middle, and end. I don't want you just to put one area for flow. I want you to break this down into beginning, middle, and end. Uh, and for most of you, the beginning is going to be your influences, how you got started, what made you interested in your chosen field. The middle is how you became talented. Uh, what classes did you take at school? Uh, what successes did you have? What projects did you work on? What, what things did you do that gave you skills? And in the end, you're standing in front of uh, the company you admire most and you want to join their team. What are you going to say to get them to say yes? What is your takeaway? What is your uh, uh, bit of logic or verbiage? to help seal the deal. Think about these things. So you're gonna put this in a document. And again, uh, I'm going to uh, share with anybody examples of what other students did. So all you have to do is write me and I will show you examples. Here's the fun one who wants to work at Blizzard. You do not have to include visuals in this document. I'm gonna show you various documents and, and uh, uh, some of them have you know mood stuff in them, but. What I really am looking for are these base uh, areas fixed. Target audience, true message, beginning, middle, end, the takeaway, and so forth. Uh, the um, star moment, etc. So some people put it into paragraph form. They put a lot of ideas together. But remember, I'm looking for uh, brainstorming. So sometimes people have to want to express themselves in their own particular way. I have lots of ideas here. And while this is a photo of a bunch of post-its, it's very clean. It's well lit. I can read it all. I'm happy for you to write, uh, do something handwritten, but I better be able to read it. But you can turn it in in any fashion that makes sense for you. For instance, uh, a lot of people think visually. So... Uh, Here's a visual mind map, and there's software that allows you to do this. It's kind of the same thing, only here's the target audience. Here's what their here's ideas about your future self. Here's the true message. Here's the beginning, middle, end. Here's the star moment. Notice that there's lots of stuff here, perhaps more than might make it into the presentation. And what are these elements? Well, uh, let me just uh, blow this up a little bit so you guys can read it. But if I, if I come over here, um, in the beginning, where I came from, technology and art, uh, my experience working with Apple, what, what he talked about with his mom, how he wanted to start using smartphones, uh, facts and figures about uh, mobile communications. So these are fa uh, ideas, shocking statistics, things he's going to use to make his case. What are things about himself? Well, he, 
He's bilingual. He has this unique perspective. He has hardware skills in, in uh, Android and Apple uh, and so forth. So as he wants to become a mobile developer, these are all things that are about uh, what he wants to do. His target audience, he's got the names of companies uh, and so on and so forth. So the more information you give me, the better. And like I say, anybody who wants examples from previous students, I'm happy to share them. But you should basically start with this planning document. Use these to tell you what you need to do. Every single one of you has to give me your target audience as uh, detailed as you can imagine it. Your true message, your future self, presentation, what is the beginning, middle, and end, and what star moment might you have. Start to think about, well, I'm going to use a visual, or I'll have a sound clip, or I'm going to uh, uh, you know, create some kind of shopping statistic, etc. Now, uh, there's some of you who might not imagine ever working for somebody else, that you want to create your own company. If that's the case, get a hold of me and ask me because I have a different kind of task for you. It's very much the same thing along the same lines, only uh, you, you'll be speaking to investors instead of to uh, an employer. But anybody who wants to work on their own or create their own company, get a hold of me and I will give you the alternate version of this. Most of you should be thinking along the lines of working for the company you most admire. So uh, think big and remember that you're projecting yourself into the future. So you get the chance to invent projects that you haven't done. You can lie a little bit. You can say, oh, well, I did this because <clears throat> obviously in the next 30 months, you're going to do lots of stuff. And maybe you haven't even gotten the assignments about it or thought about it, but you're going to get to pretend as if you've had all these experiences that you've interned at different places, that you had other jobs, uh, that you made other accomplishments, etc. Now, don't get carried away with being successful or else there's no need to be asking for a job in the first place. But you can imagine great things that we will do in the next two or three years before you go for your green, dream job. And certainly that's part of the act of imagination that you're putting in here. This presentation is projecting who the you you're going to become is. And you're presenting that person to the target audience. Don't ever forget that your presentation has to take them in mind. And what, what I find often is that uh, once people choose a target audience, they don't actually think about them talking to them. They talk about them. Like they do a presentation to me about Blizzard. Well, if I were the people who worked at Blizzard, I wouldn't want to hear about myself. I'd want to know that you knew enough about my company and my games that you knew my culture and that you would fit in. But I wouldn't want you talking about me as if uh, I didn't know who my own history was. So make sure that you're talking to your audience, not about your audience. And again, that's that's for next week when you start doing the presentation. What I want from everybody by the end of this week is to create this document, which are the elements that will go into your presentation. And pretty much for all of you, as soon as you've created this presentation, you can go on to the next phase, which is starting to create the presentation itself. You'll probably want to, to turn your presentation flow into a script so you can start to speak it out loud, etc. We'll be doing all that next week. But this week, I don't want anybody creating a presentation. I want everybody working on the pre-production document, the plan here. I want you brainstorming. I want you thinking about all the great stuff you're going to do, but I don't want you creating the presentation yet. I want you to be imagining it and planning it out and writing it down because we want to follow this process, this pre-production model, pre-production, production, post-production. Production, post uh, all right. I know I've uh, talked a lot and I've kind of uh, uh, been a little bit scattered. I don't know. I don't, it doesn't feel like I, I made uh, this as logical as I should. But um, I'm going to open it up for questions. Uh, if you need me to explain something more about the, uh, the uh, discussion assignment, I'm happy to do that. Uh, maybe I can give you more examples, etc., um, or uh, give you more examples about posting. But remember, if you're making a uh, a link out, when you make your initial post, you put in the link and then you activate the link. If you're 
uploading a file, if it's an audio file or a video file, and the maximum size, if you're uploading a file, is 500 megabytes. That's pretty good. You're only going to make something that's two to three minutes long. Even if you make something high def video, it probably will be uh, fine under that size. But all you need to do to upload it is hit attach file, drag the files there, and they will attach. And as attached, they will look like this. So uh, once we start getting some examples from other students here, you'll probably have more of a sense of what uh, everybody's doing. But uh, I'm sure I want everyone to watch the Julian Treasure video and watch these samples as well. How do we go about referencing a photo if we choose to add one? Well, um, if you make a video, a good idea is always uh, maybe put some credits right at the end. I don't know if this so one has credits at the end. That's probably like the real. real. Let's, let's see what this one has. Yeah, here's a, here's a credit at the end. So if you want to uh, reference photos or whatnot, it's usually a good idea to put it right after the, your, your thing ends, yeah. right there. And if you do an audio-only piece, then you aren't adding video, so there's nothing to reference. But if you do create, if you do use other people's material, um, uh, someone else mentioned it. Uh, another good idea, since we are doing this format here where we can uh, uh, have a, an area to post, maybe you could put your, your uh, references in the, the post part and they didn't have to be in the video. I'd prefer it to be at the back end of the video. Uh, I don't necessarily like to have photo credits in the middle while the show is running. Um, but at the end, it's always kind of nice to have that list of references. But if you wanted to make it a separate document, you could put it in with your post as well. Uh, and again, the requirement isn't that very isn't that high. Just saying where it came from, uh, the name of the website or uh, the name of the uh, uh, source, etc. Anybody else have any questions? You can raise your hand. I'll open the microphone to you, or you can type in the chat box. Uh, I see Justin Hutchison's hand up. Justin, do you have a question? Yeah, I, I kind of had to step away for a moment when you were speaking about um, the main project for the week. Um, did, were you saying something about if we are actually going to be opening a business on our own? Because um, I don't particularly have a business that I'm trying to target, so to speak. I was going to open up my own recording studio eventually as after I got out of school and uh, open it up for other people to try and help them. Well, what you're not allowed to do is to advertise your product to end users. So um, uh, if you want to go into business for yourself, what you need to do is talk about your business up to the point, and you're talking to a group of investors who are going to help you expand your business. So you okay. would assume that you'd open the music studio, and you would talk about your success to date, and you would talk about what you're going to what you're going to do next why you're why are you wanting this you know infusion of capital why do you want to expand what is what are you going to new, add new to your label etc and in okay. so you have to talk about both your management skills and your creative skills and you can't hide behind the company you can't say the company did this the company did that you're going to have to say who you are and you're going to have to talk about your own education and your personality within that company so it's it's pretty much the same things, only when you go to target audience, what you're going to tell me is who are the investors you're looking for. And again, you need to target them. You know, uh, I don't imagine you're going to go be talking to a bunch of dentists who have money to invest. You're going to look for people who have a notion of why they would want to invest in a music studio. And that, you know, uh, figure out who it is you're going to talk to that you're going to try to get for this investment from. So... That needs to be as specific as possible. So when you're doing the presentation, you know who you're talking to. Okay. All right. Thanks. Anybody else have a question? Oh, I thought there'd be lots of questions. Well, there may yet be questions coming to your head. Uh, and again, I'm going to be around all week. So if you do have questions, just message me and, um, uh, uh, I'll be uh, on the lookout for that, and I'll have this video up in about an hour. So if you need to come back and look at this again. 
Uh, but uh, this should be a fun week. Uh, creating the audiovisual project is kind of a fun thing to do. Uh, once you just get it out, uh, you know, it, it's kind of cathartic. And then uh, you can get started on thinking about your presentation. But the act of talking and telling me that story kind of loosens you up and makes you feel a little bit better about doing the main presentation. So it works well hand in hand. And I think uh, it's going to be a fun week for everybody. So I'm going to let you guys go now. And uh, anybody who has questions or, and again, anybody who wants uh, a sample uh, plan, just get a hold of me, send me a note, and I will give you samples. Thanks, guys.